as you can see, we're talking about Ephesians this morning. It is a beautiful letter. And I am really, really glad that I chose it for my book as we jump, jump into this series on New Testament books and studies. Um, and it's been a little different for me studying this way, but I've learned so much in this, and it has really helped me to just grow in my understanding and knowledge. And it's really improved kind of the way I study. Things that I know I needed to be doing, I really focused on, on doing. And I do want to take a moment to kind of stress that, because if you want to grow in your understanding of the Bible, you want to grow in your faith, you want to grow in your knowledge, you got to study things in context. I know a lot of the guys are going to talk about this, and I know everybody knows this, but it is just so helpful when we think about that and we really put it in perspective. We study in context, and we take a moment, and we look at who is doing the writing. We take a moment, we look at who are they writing to? Why are they writing that place, that individual, or that church? What issues were they facing? And what was the culture in the area? And where does that fit in the church timeline? Where does that fit in with what was going on in the first century church or what was going on in Acts? But looking at those things, if we put those things in, in our studies, it just makes the message and the picture so much more clear in our studies. And um, This is quickly becoming my favorite book in the Bible. And this book, it's just full of wonderful thoughts. And it's all about Jesus. And I know you're saying, Scott, it's all, all about Jesus. And everybody points to Jesus. But there's just some really beautiful things in here, and it's about uh, unity in Christ and salvation in Christ and walking with Christ and standing strong in Christ and just about relationships. And it really is just beautiful, and it's, um, so it's been very strengthening to study. And in, in the last five or six weeks or so since I picked this book, I've been kind of reading through the different chapters, and I'll take notes, and I wound up taking some notes on my phone and taking notes in a spiral notebook and taking notes on my laptop and taking notes on my computer so hopefully, as I tried to pull all this jumble of notes and things together I had spread out in my life, I put it together in a way that will be coherent, that will be strengthening to you and beneficial to you in our studies. But kind of what we're going to do this morning as we jump into talking about Ephesians is we're going to look quickly at just the authorship. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of Ephesus and what that city was like and the culture there and what was going on there. We're going to talk a little bit about Paul and his history with Ephesus because he spent time um, there before he wrote the letter to them. And then we're going to do just an overall breakdown of some of the themes, and then we'll summarize the verses a little bit, pull out a few, a few um, key verses, and look at those kinds of things. But as I said, jumping into this first off, I'm going to point out that Paul is the author. I want to say that early on, just so that we'll have that in our heads as we get into our study, and as I'm talking about Ephesus and the different things. Paul was the, early, uh, was the author. Um, now, there are People and uh, historians and critics that say, well, maybe it wasn't Paul. Maybe it was uh, one of his disciples just writing in his style and things like that. But uh, I'm not going to jump on the conspiracy bandwagon today. I'm going to take the writer at face value because he says several times that he is Paul. And he says that he's a prisoner. He talks about things and he writes it in Paul's style. Um, and if you read Colossians, it's very, very similar in the style and the language and things. So anyway, I'm trusting that it is Paul for this study. Um, and as you see early on, he... Um, identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And I look at that, and Paul's clear to point that out early, to say, you know, I wasn't just dubbed myself an apostle. I'm an apostle by the will of God, because I feel like he's reassuring Christians. He has spent time in Ephesus. He probably knows a lot of them, but there may be a lot of them that do not know him. But this is Paul, if we remember back, and this is Paul who was the Hebrew of Hebrews, Paul the Pharisee, Paul the, the Zealots, that persecuted the church. So I still think that he may take a moment and take time to sometimes remind people of who he is and that he is an apostle of Christ and by the will of God. Um, and also, he is writing to Christians. He's writing to the saints. He's writing to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He's writing to the church. But one thing to consider and one thing to remember, too, is these are all young churches and young Christians. They don't have generations and generations of study and knowledge and, um, and hundreds of years old churches with elders that have been passing on wisdom to the next set of elders. These are all fairly new Christians relative anyway to what we know in our world. So Paul's assuring them, you know, I'm an apostle by the will of God. And we know that Paul wrote 13 or 14 New Testament books, depending on it, if you give him credit for uh, writing Hebrews or not. But just a few things I want to mention about Paul as we jump into this, that his, he is the author, and I wanted to establish that early. So let's talk a little bit about Ephesus, where he wrote the letter. So, Eph or where he wrote the letter to. Ephesus, see, is located on the west side of modern Turkey and 
right there on the edge of the sea. And that area overall was called Asia Minor. It was also called the Mediterranean, but uh, you can see it was right there. So it was a port city, like I said, on the sea. So being a port city meant it had a lot of people uh, coming and going in and out of there. Uh, there would have been a lot of trade there. There would have been a lot of commerce there. There would have been a lot of different types of people coming there, probably bringing in a lot of different ideas as well. Um, some said that it was second only to Rome in commerce and culture and education. So I'm sure there was a lot of wisdom there, a lot of philosophy, a lot of different religious ideas. Uh, and we can see that it was home to many religious beliefs. It was home to many different religious temples. And the temple of Artemis was there, which was a huge structure. And at the time, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. And you can read the dimensions of it and the description of it. It was incredible. Um, it was destroyed. There's basically only a column or two left and a couple of small pieces there. But as I said, it was one of many different temples and religious um, buildings and things that were there in this place because it was home to a lot of different thoughts. Because of its location, it was invaded and ruled over many, many times. Um, the Hittites, the Lydians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Ottomans, all flourished in that area at one time or another. So, of course, they probably brought in lots of different ideas and ideology and religions. And as I said, it was a place of temples and a place of pagan gods and religious structures. And we all know a lot of the legends and stories of the Greek and the Roman gods. Well, they were worshippers of them, and there were statues to them and temples and things to those people in this area. Um, and I'm going to take a moment. Oh, yeah, and they were under rule from Rome now at this point when the first century church was being established. But I've got a few pictures of some of the ruins. hope it doesn't distract you. But I did want to pop these in because I just kind of want us to have an idea of this city and what it was like in our minds as we read through and discuss this letter a little bit because it was an impressive city. Um, somebody referred to it as the jewel of the Mediterranean. I can't remember where I read that, but when I was reading the history of it back then. Uh, but it had huge libraries, and it had gymnasiums and big structures. And apparently now, it is one of the, uh, has some of the best ruins, I guess, that you can go and visit and see from, uh, from the uh, cities at that time. But he said, libraries, gymnasiums, there were bathhouses there, huge amphitheater seating, 25,000 people. Um, the population was about 250,000. But remember this amphitheater, because later as we talk a little bit about the book itself, there's a story or a scene where they, uh, the ride insights, and a bunch of them rush to the theater, it says, and they get out there and they're talking. Well, in my studies, this is the only theater that I've found mention of and in looking at the history. So I think that's where it happened, which is pretty cool to think about as we talk about the story, we really pictured in our head, that's probably where they were going to, and that's probably where they were leading the discussion down from that very floor right there. But there were streets made of white marble lined with shops and restaurants. So it was a magnificent city, and it was a city in some ways not that different even than cities that we're familiar with in these days because they had technology and they had art and they had a lot of commerce and a lot of trade and they probably thought highly of themselves because that was kind of the culture at the time. They were a very me-centered culture that Paul is going to go in here in this large city and start a church and try to spread the gospel. So let's talk a little bit about Paul in his time before he wrote the letter because he spent some time in Ephesus and um, he had four major missionary trips, and then before that, he did a lot of little small different things along the way. But he arrives in Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey, and he was only there for a little while. And he had Priscilla and Aquila with him, and he left them there essentially to probably just to start spreading the gospel and working on establishing a church. In verse 19, it says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there, talking about Priscilla and Aquila. And we're going to visit with them again in a minute. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So Paul leaves after a short time, but he tells him he wants to come back, and he's going to try to come back if he's able to do so. Um, so later, we know he does uh, return to Ephesus after traveling through Galatia and uh, Phrygia and, and some of the upper regions in that area, and we're going to read more of that in a minute in Acts uh, chapter 19. But towards the end of Acts 18, so he just leaves. We've got Priscilla and Aquila are left there. Okay, so keep that in mind. They're, they're starting to spread the word. They encounter Apollos. And remember, Apollos is preaching the baptism of John. That's all that he knows. And they pull him aside. They talk to him, and they correct him. And Paul's going to encounter some similar things uh, when he returns. What we see in verse 25 of Acts 18, it says, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord 
And being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So Priscilla and Aquila, they pull him aside, they talk to him, and, and they teach him uh, Jesus and the crucifixion and those things, and the baptism of Christ. So, oh, one more, sorry. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, and they took him into the way, expounded unto him of God more perfectly. But I brought this up because Paul's going to return on his third missionary journey. Not that long later, and he, one of the first things he encounters is the same similar situation. In verse 2, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto him, John's baptism. So Paul encounters these individuals right off the bat, and they're basically saying the same thing Apollos did. And I don't think I'd ever really stopped and looked at that and realized, Oh, that's the same location. That's right after that. That's the people that. You know, Paul had left, and here he is now. So we see that was a situation going on in that area, and it makes me wonder, were these guys taught by Apollos, this guy who's boldly speaking the word, or were they all taught together by somebody else? Just interesting things to think about. But we do see that that was kind of a situation that was going on there. So they did need to learn more about God, and they did need to be educated in those things. Um, so Paul now is there, and he stays about two and a half years in Ephesus, and he preaches in the synagogue for three months, and they kind of run him off out of there. They get tired of him. And then he goes and preaches daily, it says, in the hall of Tyrannus. We don't know exactly what that was. Um, sometimes it's called a lecture hall. Sometimes it's called a school. I don't know if he would rented that building from them or if the guy was a Christian and said, yes, please teach the word of God from here. But it's something he did daily, apparently. And while he was there, he healed people, and he drove out spirits, and um, people started coming to him even. And to be healed, as we know that always happens, and coming to see who he was. But the word of God begins to spread here, and many do begin to believe, and he is making an impact. And if you remember, this was an area of pagan beliefs. It was an area of sorcery even, and magic, and we see some of those things. People start to turn away from those things. And in Acts 19 and verse 19, it says, Many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So the word of God is spreading. People are hearing it. It is changing lives. It is affecting an entire culture, an entire uh, city. In fact, it's affecting an entire economy. And some people are starting to grow angry at that because it is actually affecting things. And Demetrius, the silversmith, He's a man who made things for worship of the gods. He made things to worship the goddess Diana. And he's angry because Paul's converting people away from these beliefs. And that's his craft, making these things for worship. So it's hurting his craft. It's hurting his ability to make money. And it's changing the economy around him. So he's going to incite a riot, um, a pretty big riot. And Paul wants to go out and wants to help. But verse 20 says, that when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. So I think that maybe that theater that we talked about earlier, we can see the masses now confused, rushing out to this area. And I know that Paul tried to go out and help, but his disciples said, No, you need to stay. That's going to be a very dangerous situation. And finally, after a couple of hours, apparently, of them rioting and shouting some things, um, the town clerk was able to settle things down and kind of put things back into place. And it's said that some people didn't even know why they were there, which is usually the way it goes. That's the way the mob mentality. But Paul's been here a while now because after this, he decides to go ahead and leave. But during that time that he was there, he spread the gospel. And this continued by the space of two years that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And that is a powerful thing. From the city of Ephesus, Ephesus the gospel went to the entire region of Asia Minor with an estimated population of 8 to 15 million people in two years. And this was a culture that was not in favor of Christianity, a culture that had a lot of different kinds of beliefs. But through the work and the spreading of God's word, they reached a lot of people and they made a tremendous amount of change with those people and with that culture, and that amazes me. So, talking a little bit about Ephesians, now getting back to sort of overviewing the book itself, we already established that Paul was the author, and um, it mentions his name twice. We read one earlier, and then in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. 
So I do believe it was Paul. He also oftentimes, again, says, I prisoner, things like that. Likely written from prison in Rome when he was in prison or sort of a house arrest type situation. During that time, he also wrote Philippians, Colossians, and um, Philemon. Oh, and I said the writer mentions being a prisoner many times he establishes those things. And most likely written between 60 and 63 AD, which is around the time that Paul spent in that house arrest in Rome. And I just, I'm probably going to talk about this later, but that always amazes me. Paul is in prison and he's writing to us and praying for us and spreading God's word and writing these incredible letters. And I think about me worried about school starting this week and how stressed I am and I can barely do anything. And here's Paul in prison. You know, and if I was writing people from prison, I'd probably be complaining about the food and how bored I was. But he's taking time to pray for us and wanting us to know the love of God. And we read these prayers, and I encourage you to go and read a lot more in the book that I'm going to touch on. And it's just, just beautiful. And what an incredible example that Paul is in there and what he does. But, um, and that's what this book is. This book, an example of God's work changing lives in the face of false religions, in the face of idolatry, in true counterculture, you know, in the Greek society where masters abused slaves and husbands dominated wives, Paul's teaching love and service and submission. It's amazing. We're going to take a few minutes and we're going to look at some of that. Um, But as we get into this as well, it's a little bit different. There's a few things that aren't necessarily standard in a lot of Paul's stuff, but because he doesn't use any personal references to people in the beginning or in, you know, a lot of times he does do greetings or he does do a lot of goodbyes. He mentions people by name. That's a little bit different. And also the book really doesn't address specific issues or big problems like other books. Now, there are some things that we can probably pull out, um, like, you know, the people, the magic users and the false god worship, because he does spend a lot of time emphasizing that um, God and Christ is head over everything. So, of course, we can pull some of those out. But it's fairly general themes, more universal, faith, unity, Christian living. I mean, it's very positive compared to some of the other things that he writes when he is addressing specific issues in some of the other books. Um, And I wonder if that means, was it for several churches? Were there more churches in the area by the time he wrote that? Maybe it wasn't just one church, or maybe it was going to be spread around. I don't know. Um, Something I read that was kind of interesting said that maybe he didn't address a bunch of specific names because he knew the Ephesians so well he didn't feel the need to. It was like writing a family. You know, maybe you don't write a big flowery intro when you know the people really well. I don't know. Just things to think about, kind of some stuff in the white spaces that's kind of interesting. Um, But we talked about Paul. He says he's Paul the Apostle. He's the writer. Um, And let's break it down. We're going to break this book into three categories. And there's a lot of different ways you can break it up. You can get more detailed or not. But I broke it up into three sections. Ephesians 1 through 3. Um, He talks about all being saved. Grace, not works, is how we're saved. Talks about unity in Christ, that we are Christ, and kind of knowing your place in Christ and those relationships. The second part of the book, Ephesians 4 through 6, verse 9, is all about walking with Christ. Everything you do every day in your life, walking with Christ. Having him is part of the relationships and every relationship that you have in life, and it's a really beautiful section on just how to live with Christ. And then the last part, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 24, it's all about standing strong in the Lord, and that's that section a lot of us have heard many times where he talks about putting on the whole armor of God. So we're just going to spend a couple minutes. I'm going to touch a little on each chapter, just pull a few key verses out. Um, as we go through this. Keep in mind the things we talked about with Ephesus, where he's at, what that location is like, the people that he's dealing with as we go into this study. But chapter one, you know, he's doing a lot of trying to help Christians grow in spiritual knowledge and understanding. And he's talking about essentially the gospel story, Um, not just telling the life of Jesus, but he's painting a picture of the gospel story. And it's really beautiful. He talks a lot about Um, us needing to be open to understanding and us learning wisdom and prudence, opening our hearts to understanding the gospel. In verse 7, he says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So he's talking about Christ's blood and that we're redeemed in it. And the word adoption comes up a lot in this book. I don't remember how many times I touched on it, but it's in there five or six times because it's opened up that idea that we're all can be adopted now into the family of God, and that's kind of where that comes through. So he kind of sets things up, and it sort of, as I said, moves through indirectly kind of through the gospel. And continuing in verse 9, he says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So 
he uses the word mystery a lot as well. We start to kind of uncover that mystery and talk about what that mystery is. And here he says, having made known us the mystery of his will, and down below it's that he might gather together in one all things in Christ which are in heaven. And we're going to come back to that and kind of elaborate a little more on that mystery and what that mystery means as we go through the book some. Um, I want to take a moment and look at this because this is a really beautiful, comforting passage to me. In verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So it's kind of continuing that gospel story. In whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And that's one of those things I skipped through before. It never took a lot of time to really look at. But the word earnest there, what's that mean? That's, that's talking about essentially like a down payment or a pledge. I give you something up front is a promise that I'm going to get you to the end or I'm going to come back later. There's going to be more to come. So he's continuing this gospel story. Now you're a believer, you're a member of the church. Well, your earnest, your down payment, your pledge is the Holy Spirit to be with you, to guide you, and to see you through to the end and help you get to completion. And I thought that was just a really beautiful passage. I'm sure all you already had seen that and looked at, studied the earnest before. I just caught my attention. I thought that was really um, beautiful. So read a couple more verses here. Verse 20 says, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Important passage to kind of end that chapter with, or wrap that chapter with, with, he's reminding these pagan people who believed in a lot of different gods and a lot of different ideas that Christ is head over all things. He's the one and only. He's the head over all things, the church. And essentially, he's kind of wrapping up that gospel story. Not wrapping it up, but adding to that gospel story as he explains to them. So chapter 2, he basically continues with that gospel story. And he says, and you, you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And he talks a lot about the idea of being freed from the bondage of sin, of being new creatures and walking as new creatures, um, putting away that old self. And Christ saved us and promised us riches to come. Verse 8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we've talked about this before, and everyone knows this idea, but saved by grace, not works. Well, what is grace? Grace, essentially, is unmerited favor. Getting something that you really don't deserve, that you really did not earn, and we did not earn grace. I mean, we did not do any works to earn our salvation, so what is our unmerited favor? Our unmerited favor is salvation through Christ's death. As he's tying it back to the gospel story. That is our unmerited favor. And essentially, putting it bluntly, men who deserve hell receive heaven because of this unmerited favor, this grace, salvation through Christ's death. Verse 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You're looking for your purpose in life, like a lot of people are in the world? To me, there it is. Good works, walking in them. And that's not earning our salvation. We're doing that because we're saved, because we have faith, because we believe. But a lot of people are looking for a purpose in life and looking for something to do day to day. We should wake up, focus on good works and walking in them, serving others and living that kind of life, and that's what he's telling them there. Pick up in verse 13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So what's he talking about there? He says, verse 14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Jews were the only children of God before, right? That's what we knew. But now that barrier has come down. We go back to the idea of adopted any of us can be adopted now into the family of Christ. And he's stressing that to them because I'm sure there was a lot of confusion at this time period. We know that. We see a lot of books and letters that they write addressing that very topic, confusion between, you know, what was going on with the Jews and what was going on with Christ. Well, that barrier is down. And now it says Gentiles can be made nigh, being brought close because of the blood of Christ. And this chapter kind of continues in chapter 3, to, to build on this idea, um, verse 1 through 7, he's talking about the Gentiles being receiver of grace, being receivers of salvation now, being receivers of that mystery. And he defines the mystery again. Verse 4 in there, it says, whereby when you read, 
you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Because remember, in Old Testament times, the Jews thought they were the only children of God, and they were on an island. They were set apart from everybody else, but not anymore. Um, and this is obviously a certain area of confusion at this time, a lot of things they had to address. You know, and in the Old Testament, the Messiah was prophesied all the time, over and over and over and over. But there wasn't a whole lot of talk about the Jews and the Gentiles coming together. That really, I think, caught them off guard and threw them for a little bit of a loop, and all of a sudden, Paul's preaching to the Gentiles, and they're joining us. That was kind of confusing. Um, but Paul starts this prayer, at, to me, I don't know why this is funny to me. It's like he says, I'm going to pray for you. And then he gets distracted and he talks about why for like 14 verses or something. And then he comes back in verse 14 and he talks about this beautiful prayer that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of of God, and I just, it's amazing to me. Again, Paul just wants us to know Jesus and his love, and again, he's in prison, and that's what he's doing. He's focusing on us. He's focusing on others. He's focusing on spreading God's word. Didn't matter what struggles he was facing in his own life. That was his focus, and that's everything that he did. Spend time thinking about other people and other Christians. So chapter four, Paul's doing a lot of encouraging to walk in faith and unity. Things kind of shift a little bit now. Verse one, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So he's talked to them now about Christ and being redeemed in his blood and becoming a Christian and receiving the Holy Spirit. And now you're adopted into the family. Well, what do we do now? Now you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. You continue in that walk and you make it a part of your everyday life and in everything you do. And he urges unity in all things, reminding them that there's one Lord and that there's one Spirit and there's one baptism and all these things. Um, and it talks about the church being given a variety of tools, you know, some apostles and some teachers and prophets and different things to help them grow in the knowledge and understanding, to become more and more like Christ each and every day so they will not be constantly led about and tossed to and fro. And verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. He's just encouraging them to become mature Christians. And really, that's what this whole book is. Grow as a Christian. The church grow together in unity and doing the right thing. Um, teach us to be able to stand tall and discern right from wrong in our everyday life. We're new men. We need to walk as new godly men, putting away our old mistakes, our old sins, and our old problems. And if you know Christ's love, then 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Jumping into chapter 5, he's kind of continuing the same thing, continuing instruction and walking in Christ. Verse 1, he says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to his sweet-smelling Savior. And he warns against them spending time with sinful people and engaging in the things that they're doing. Instead, teach them. Be the example to them. Be the light for them. And he says that, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye the light in the world. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And he goes on here to discuss the hierarchy in the church and the family. And life, and he talks about wives submitting to the husbands, the head of like Christ is the head of the church, and husbands loving your wives as he loved the church. And I want to take a moment and I want to talk about that. Verse 33, he says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Husbands unconditionally love your wives, and wives unconditionally respect your husbands. 
If you haven't done the Love and Marriage series or the Love and Respect series yet with Jerry and Kathy, you should do it. It's beautiful. But this is something every couple needs to hear and needs to understand. And this has nothing to do with men being better than women. It isn't about us. It is about God's will. Husbands, unconditionally loving your wives. Not because they are always perfect and sweet and helpful and beautiful and everything that they say and do, even though a lot of them are probably. But they're human. They make mistakes. It's not about that. We unconditionally love them because it's God's will, and that's what he wants us to do. That's what he commands us to do. And wives, unconditionally respecting our husbands. And the world may tell you that that is weak, but I have to tell you that's not true. That is the opposite of that. It takes a strong, godly, faithful woman to always unconditionally respect us because we make a lot of mistakes, and we are not always brilliant and loving and thoughtful and full of incredible ideas, but it's God's will that we do those things for each other. And when we do those things, if we do what we're supposed to do, it's a lot easier for the other to do their part. If I love my wife like Christ loved the church, giving her everything, putting her first in everything, looking out for her in every way, it's a lot easier for her in turn then to trust me and respect me and follow me and vice versa. So just take that with you, think about that, and some of you have probably done the study and studied this before and thought about it, but it's just always a good reminder for each and every one of us, I feel like. And then chapter six, he's continuing kind of talking about destruction in Christian living. He's talking about relationships. And he's talking about all facets of life, whether you're a child, talking about your parents, whether you're a father and his kids, whether you're a servant and a master, a master and a servant, whatever it is, God needs to be in the middle of everything and in the middle of of that relationship, and we need to respect, and we need to honor, and we need to obey each other. Verse 1 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And we can apply those attitudes in everything that we do, and he continues on talking about that, and he says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So in every situation, whether you're the boss or you are the employee, the parent or the child, we do it as a humble servant of God with love. He tells those in authority to have love and service, remembering God's will and the choices you make. And a holy life means submission to the proper authorities with God's love. If we have a horrible boss, don't be a good employee for that boss. Be a good employee for God. Kids, if you go to school this week and you don't like your new teacher, don't be a good student for that teacher. Be a good student for God then. Remember that, and that will encourage you and help you through some of those difficult days. That is going to help me this year to be an encouraging good teacher with some of the kids I might have. And I'm sure they'll all be wonderful. So getting to the end here, verse 10, this is where he kind of switches gears. Um. And he's been talking about walking with God, how to grow and mature as a Christian, how to let our light shine and how to act in any situation, handle our relationships. But now if we've done those things and we've been walking in the Lord and we're in the place we need to be, then we should be ready to stand with God and to stand against the devil and to stand against whatever form that may come at us, whatever temptations may come at us, hopefully leaning on the power of Christ. And he goes on to instruct us here in putting on the whole armor of God. Um, and he reminds us that in those battles, no matter what they may look like, they're really spiritual in nature because that's what matters, how we respond spiritually, not necessarily what we do physically. In verse 14, he says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. One thing I want us to notice in this list of the armor, there's no crossbow, there's no catapult, there's no club or bow and arrow. It's essentially all defensive weapons. I know there's a sword, but a sword is used to defend against another sword or other things. And the reason it's all defensive weapons is because we already hold the ground because Jesus won. We don't need to go out and attack. Jesus already won. We just have to defend the ground and stand firm with Christ. He defeated death. He overcame the grave. We already have 
victory in Jesus. We already belong to Jesus. We're cleansed by his blood. Now we need to hold the lines of the enemy and Satan and the world and those things back. And he basically closes on hoping to continue spreading the gospel and he wants them to know all the things that he's doing and he loves them and uh, and peace and grace for all. He says, verse 23, peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So this book, I think, is a beautiful writing. It reminds us that the gospel is something something for all. And it's not just something that we do here in the church service. It's something that we live in each day of our lives, in our homes, our schools, our workplace, and in our relationships. That's how we change the world, letting our light shine in our families and our friends. In Ephesus was a city kind of like ours, full of different beliefs and religious ideas and art and technology and wisdom of men. But the gospel spread there and it changed people and it changed lives. And kind of wrapping up this thought, in our first section there, talked about sitting with God, having our identity with God. In uh, chapter 2, verse 6, he said, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Knowing our identity as a Christian, that we are Christ, that we are heirs to the kingdom, that we are spiritually blessed. In our second section, second section, in chapter 4, verse 1, he talked about walking when he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation where ye are called. Christ should be in every aspect of our life, every day in our daily walk. We are his in every relationship we have. In the last section, he's telling us to stand. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So we sit with God in our identity as Christians. We walk each and every day as Christians, living our life for God and everything that we do, and then we stand firmly against the things that may come at us in this life, against the temptations, against the devil, and against the things of the world to let our light shine. So if you're here this morning, and maybe you feel like you haven't been walking with Christ, you haven't been putting him in everything and in every relationship, and that's a struggle for you, and that's bothering you, or maybe you're here this morning, you haven't been doing a good job of standing against the temptations of the things that are coming at you. And that is bothering you. You need the prayers of the church. We want to pray with you. We want to help you. We want to work with you. If you're here this morning and you haven't even begun to sit together with Christ, you haven't begun that walk and you're not a Christian and you want to begin that walk, we can help you with that as well. We can baptize you this morning. If any of these things apply to you, come forward, have a seat in the first row, and we will help you as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.